Hello everybody, welcome to Unit 1 Biology Area Study 2. Today we are looking at the regulation of varying systems. So we're going to look at the regulation of water balance in vascular plants. If you don't remember what a vascular plant is, look at the last video. Um, regulation of body temperature, blood glucose and water balance. So we're going to be looking at homeostasis, um, the stimulus response model, positive and negative feedback loops and the malfunctions of homeostatic mechanisms. So what type 1 diabetes is, hypoglycemia and hypothyroidism. So we make a start looking at regulation of water in um, plants. In particular, we are looking at vascular plants. So remember, vascular plants are basically plants that have vascular tissue. So they're able to transport water from the roots to the leaves um, and glucose as well and nutrients throughout the plant as required. And the two major tissues that we look at are the xylem tissue and the phloem tissue. So the xylem tissue are tubes that transport water and minerals like potassium or nitrogen um, in one direction from the roots to the leaves. Okay, so we're going from root to the leaves. And the phloem tissue are tubes that transport sugars and other nutrients around the plant in both directions. So you can see here in the xylem, there's just that one-way flow of water and minerals, whereas the phloem, there's a two-way flow. Okay, and that's really important. In terms of transpiration, okay, so we are looking at the amount of water lost due to transpiration is basically dependent on environmental conditions that surround the plant, okay? So environmental conditions that might affect transpiration and water sort of loss um, is temperature. So at higher temperatures, there's going to be more water that evaporates from the leaves. Light, in light um, conditions that are higher, the stomata can open to increase the amount of carbon dioxide that's going to be absorbed for photosynthesis, and that would increase the amount of water that's going to be lost. Humidity, okay, at any temperature, there's air and it has a maximum amount of water vapor so um, that can be dissolved within it. So as humidity will increase, that means less water can evaporate, and at 100% relative humidity, water can't evaporate at all, so transpiration can't occur at that point either. The wind... Um, on calm days, the water released from the stomata stays near the leaf, um, creating a humid layer again on the air, um, of the air on the surface of the leaf. So on a windy day, this humid layer is going to be blown away, um, and that's going to encourage water vapor to then exit the leaf as well. Water availability is another one. So when water availability is high, the roots are going to absorb more of that water. Um, the plant can therefore afford to increase the rate of transpiration and lose more water. So the more that it takes in, the more that it can let out. This diagram sort of sums up um, those factors over here. In order to reduce the amount of transpiration that's happening, what um, the plant can do is it can actively pump potassium ions out of the guard cells um, that exist. The water can also diffuse out of the vacuoles in the guard cells and each guard cell can also become more flaccid, okay, closing the stomata. As you can see, the difference between the stomata being open and the stomata being closed. Okay, um, looking at the xylem and the phloem. Um, so in terms of the xylem here, again, you can see the direction of water movement is one way, whereas the phloem, we've got two-way movement as well. Really important in terms of movement within the phloem and movement within the xylem. All right, next bit is looking at homeostasis. So homeostasis is basically the maintenance of a stable internal environment. So no matter what the temperature is outside, no matter what the pH is, no matter what is happening outside of the body, our internal environment is going to remain stable. Okay, and our body has different ways that we can sort of adjust to the changes that are happening. So we have two feedback loops that we look at. We have what we call the positive feedback system and the negative feedback system. So when you think of the positive feedback system, what I want you to think of is like a change enhancing a greater change. Okay, so one small thing and then getting larger and larger and making this signal a lot greater. Whereas negative feedback is like a change leads to a change and that change leads back to that initial change. So it's kind of like increase, decrease, increase, decrease, increase, decrease, and it kind of goes into a loop. Every feedback mechanism is going to have a stimulus, okay? So a stimulus is something that is going to initiate some sort of change. The receptor is what's going to detect that change. The modulator is going to understand what that change is, and um, the effector is what's going to carry out that change, and the response is the response, what happens as a result. So 
In terms of our feedback loops, okay, if we're going directly stimulus receptor modulator effective response, that's positive feedback. When we return um, back to a set point, that's what we're calling our negative um, feedback loop because it's going to loop back to the beginning. In terms of the stimulus response models, there's different types of receptors that can detect that change. Okay, so thermoreceptors, they're things that can detect the temperature, thermo. Um, Noisoreceptors, they detect pain, painful stimuli. Baroreceptors, they detect changes in pressure. Um, chemoreceptors, chemical concentration, and photoreceptors will be changes in light. So in terms of looking at homeostasis, we are going to be looking at the regulation of temperature, blood glucose, and osmoregulation, which is water regulation. So if we begin by looking at temperature regulation, no matter what the temperature is outside the body, our body wants to try to keep the temperature stable. Okay, so it could be super cold outside, it could be super hot outside, but our body's going to remain stable. Um, so we're going to basically go through what happens when we are too hot um, and when we are too cold. So basically our stimulus that we're going to talk about first is an increase in internal body or environmental temperature. So when the temperature is too high, so this is an increase temperature, and this one here will be a decreased temperature. So when your temperature is increased, okay, the receptors that detect that are going to be the thermoreceptors. They're going to send a message to the brain, to the hypothalamus, okay? And that's going to result in a few sort of things that can um, relay that message. So sweat glands, small blood vessels in the skin, the cerebral cortex, the erector pili muscles, and the cells, they are the effectors. They're the things that are going to transmit some sort of change. The response when we are too hot, we know is sweating, dilation of the arterioles, also known as vasodilation, changes in behavior. So you might decide, oh, I'm going to not wear a jumper inside. I'm going to turn the air con on, things like that. Flattening of the hair um, as well to sort of decrease that insulating layer and decrease in metabolic rate. Once our temperature has declined from being too hot, we will fit that negative feedback, okay? In terms of decreased temperature, okay, um, again, the thermoreceptors, I'm going to send a message to the hypothalamus, but this time it's going to be our skeletal muscle cells, our small blood vessels, our cerebral cortex, our erector pili muscles, our cells, and our brown fat as the effectors. And now you probably could name some of these already, things like shivering, you know that's what happens when you're cold, um, constriction of your arterial, so this is called vasoconstriction, changes in behavior, so again, turning on the heater, putting a jumper on this time, lifting of the hair, we call that piloerection, sort of creating like a um, insulating layer of air that your body will then warm up, um, increases metabolic rate um, and burning of triglycerides, so certain fats might start to get burnt as well to warm you up. So they are what can happen with temperature changes. Let's move on to glucose regulation. So we know glucose regulation is required in terms of we need glucose for respiration to happen, to produce ATP in our body. Um, where this glucose is coming from is our foods and the things that we eat. Okay, so once you've just eaten the meal, you're going to notice that your blood glucose levels are going to rise and your body has to maintain that. Okay, so it has to regulate that. So we might actually start off with the pathway used to reduce elevated blood glucose levels. So if you've just eaten a meal, your blood glucose levels are going to be a little bit high. They're going to be a bit elevated. So what is um, targeted is your receptor, which is the pancreas. Okay, inside the pancreas, there's a certain section called the islet of Langerhans, which are beta cells, um, and they're going to secrete insulin. And insulin is going to act on your skeletal muscle and your liver cells to increase the uptake of glucose via the insertion of glucose transporters in your membrane and increase the conversion of what we call glucose into glucagon. So glucagon is just stored glucose, okay, which is going to decrease the blood glucose levels because it's coming up as storage. In terms of the opposite, if the blood glucose levels are low, again, your islet of Langerhans in the pancreas is going to be um, receiving that signal 
but this time it's the alpha cells and they're going to release glucagon instead okay so beta cells release insulin alpha cells release glucagon the liver is going to allow um, the breakdown of glycogen into glucose which is going to be released into the bloodstream okay so a way that i like to sort of summarize this is glucose levels are too high initiates secretion of insulin for the uptake of glucagon a uh, glycogen sorry glycogen okay which is stored glucose and that's going to be stored in your um liver and then if the glycogen storage is high and not enough glucose that glycogen can be broken down into glucose okay and glucagon is the hormone that is allowing that breakdown so you can see here a summary of insulin and glucagon as being the two major hormones that are involved in these processes looking at water regulation so water balance osmoregulation is controlled again by the body when water levels are too low adh is a specific type of hormone called antidiuretic hormone and it's secreted by the posterior posterior pituitary gland in response to high solute concentrations in the blood okay so adh actually increases the amount of water that's going to be reabsorbed renin as well okay is an enzyme that's going to be secreted by the kidneys in response to low blood pressure and volume and it initiates again reabsorption of water okay so it increases the excretion of potassium and um, allows the increase of absorption of water so they're two that are really important when we talk about water regulation um, and they can filtrate that back into the bloodstream so when water levels are too high secretion of adh is suppressed but when water levels are too low adh is increased and that's what this is um summarizing over here as well so you can pause the video and have a look but again looking at too low water levels and too high water levels and what happens there the adh and renin are the two main parts in terms of malfunctions of homeostatic mechanism this is where homeostasis isn't occurring the way that it should so those hormones aren't acting the way that they should be or they aren't being secreted um, type 1 diabetes you may have heard in response to glucose regulation so type 1 diabetes basically occurs when the body cannot um, secrete insulin okay so it's basically destroying insulin secreting beta cells in the pancreas and so this prevents normal blood glucose regulation from happening because glucose can't um, be decreased because insulin is not being secreted so as a result beta cells basically um, attack people with type 1 diabetes are insulin deficient and can lead to the development of hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia so hyperglycemia is basically where your blood glucose levels are constantly above the normal range and hypoglycemia is where the blood glucose levels below the normal range okay looking at hyperthyroidism that is basically a condition caused by an overactive thyroid gland so in this case um, there's basically increased thyroid hormones um, secreted into the body and this can cause a wide range of symptoms as well if you guys have any questions leave them in the comments below again these videos are just a summary but i'm happy to answer any questions that you may have all right have a nice day bye